Hi, and welcome to CJSR's Think, a series created to highlighting lectures and keynote addresses from noteworthy individuals about some of the most crucial issues facing the world today. I'm Matt Hergy. On this episode, Robert Fisk, a multiple award-winning journalist on the Middle East, speaks at the University of Alberta for International Week 2013, an event dedicated to the expansion of conscious cultures and the knowledge of global issues. Based in Beirut, Robert Fisk has been the Middle East correspondent of the UK-based newspaper, The Independent, for more than 30 years. Fisk has been awarded more British and international journalism awards than any other foreign correspondent, and is one of the few Western journalists to have interviewed Osama bin Laden, which he did on three different occasions. On this episode of Think, Fisk expounds upon his pacifist beliefs and the negative effects that first world violent actions in the Middle East have on the world as a whole. Having never voted in his life, Fisk believes that journalism must, quote, challenge authority, all authority, end quote. This is a conviction that Fisk expresses in his keynote address entitled, Arab Awakening, Are We Hearing the Truth? In the address, Fisk draws attention to the state of the Middle East today and how it is portrayed by the rest of the world and then goes on to discuss his personal views on dictatorships. Without further ado, here is Robert Fisk, speaking at the University of Alberta's International Week 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. Um, If you came because you are dedicated Uh, to the Middle East. I think you're very brave to have come through that snow. If you came to listen to me in that snow, you might be certifiably insane, or so you would decide at the end of this evening. Um, I say that because for the first time I noticed this past year, I deliberately distorted a word in a report I wrote, the first time in 37 years when I sent it to London. I'd been down to the uh, port of Sidon in southern Lebanon, at the capital of southern Lebanon, to interview an imam who was very uh, anti-Hezbollah, anti-Bashar al-Assad. And of course, he had a long white beard, spoke very well. He was riding around on a bicycle, and I was huffing and puffing, trying to keep up with him. When I got back to Beirut, I, of course, was writing my report to send to London. And I suddenly, when I was reading it through, I noticed I called him the elderly imam, at which point I realized that he was 64 and I was 66. (laughs) So. Of course, I changed elderly to (laughs) middle-aged. So you may think later on (laughs) you you regret being here. Right, now I'm going to ask you to be word of honour honest to me. How many of you, five weeks ago, hands up, knew the name of the capital of Mali? Not bad, but not terribly uh, good. Now, here's a Stephen Harper question. How many of you... No, and you don't have to shout it out because I'll give it the name of the capital of Tajikistan. Pretty miserable, frankly. (laughs) It's Dushanbe, but I admit I only realized that three years ago when I went to the Turkish Airlines check-in desk and saw my ticket. The point I'm making is that at the moment in Tajikistan and in Kazakhstan, we're breeding some new monsters. So that in 20 years' time, we'll have to have an invasion, and we'll say that anyone who disagrees is an appeaser, and we'll call the relevant dictator the Hitler of Kazakhstan or whatever. Because at that time, we won't want any history. We'll say, oh, never mind what happened in the past. How do we deal with the problem now? Which is how we manage to get away with our invasions and our extraordinary adventures in the Middle East, which um, uh, end up in such a a bloodlust and a bloodbath. What are we doing in Mali? I say we, I'm talking about the C-17 that you've generously contributed, and I'm talking about the the British claim that they might help, maybe. Um, 2,500 French soldiers are now claiming they've virtually captured all of Mali, which is bigger than France, along with, well, let me just go perhaps first of all to um, what the French defense minister said 
uh, three, two and a half weeks ago. The Islamist insurgents, he said, have diversified their tactics. Well, they would, wouldn't they, if the French are coming. They can leave a town at any time or mingle with the population. Yeah, well, of course. It's urban guerrilla warfare as well as a normal war. So it's very complicated to manage. Yeah, I imagine. And what else do we learn? This, within a week of the start of the Mali adventure, Human Rights Watch, citing credible information, tell us that in the town of Niono in central Mali, a number of Tuareg and Arab civilians have been subjected to serious abuses, including murder. Murder being a pretty big abuse, if you think about it. And of course, the point is that the Malian army, which actually staged a coup d'etat a year ago, and killed quite a lot of Malian soldiers who were trained by your special forces, the Malian ar army are our new allies. They make you uh, an ally of the Malian army because of the C-17 helping the French. So now, within a week, they're starting a little bit of ethnic cleansing. I called up my old friend Adrian Jolm, Middle East correspondent in Jerusalem for Le Figaro. Awful newspaper, great reporter. And also a former member of the French Foreign Legion, so he's the right guy to ask. I said, Adrian, what on earth are you doing in Mali? He said, it's very strange, Robert. He said, you know, Mali has had a civil war for 30 years because the, the Touregs and the Arabophone people and the Berbers in the north have never accepted a black government in Bamako, in, in, in the south. So it's a, it's a civil war we're now involved in, in the war on terror. I, by the way, do not believe in the war on terror. It's nonsense. It's part of the production phase. <laughs> but what I'm saying is we're in a civil war with a kind of veil of Islamis, Islamism over the top of it at the moment. Um, I've felt for a long time that Al-Qaeda has changed. It is not the Al-Qaeda of Osama bin Laden and his endless talk of the world caliphate. Uh, I think that although Al-Qaeda still use this kind of phraseology, it's changed. It was interesting that um, at the, towards the end of his life, before he was murdered, of course he was murdered by the Americans, um, he began to be deeply anguished, so he claimed, at the <coughs> way in which uh, Al-Qaeda was slaughtering Shiite Muslims in Iraq. Um, I know as a fact, because um, it's popped up in the files from the CIA, that um, one of the last things he did in the last weeks of his life was to ask his colleagues in Yemen to send him an Arabic translation of an article that I wrote in The Independent, saying that Al-Qaeda had become the most sectarian organization in the world. Um, horrifically, the translation was rather good, and, but we don't know what he thought about it, because, of course, he got knocked off um, before we could hear. But interesting, because I think he was already realizing that Al-Qaeda was way, way, way out of the central line of any Muslim thinking. And as proof, well, on all the streets of the revolutions that I covered, literally on the streets, I never saw in Egypt or Bahrain or Syria a single flag of Al-Qaeda or photograph of Osama bin Laden. He was a has-been. He was yesterday's man when he died. And he was already able to look at the protests and the massive um, demonstrations in Egypt on the television before he was shot. And he saw no pictures of Al-Qaeda. So I think that the new Al-Qaeda has got a different tactic. It doesn't want to have a world caliphate, though it'll go on saying so. It wants to draw us, when I say us, by the way, it's the West in quotation marks, into the Muslim world to humiliate us, as it did in Iraq, as it will continue to do at the moment in Afghanistan, as it will do in Mali. Um, any other thoughts of other areas where we might get involved? Not Syria, surely. <laughs> well, I, no, not Algeria. The Algerians, uh, military are far too brutal to let any new spring start there. But the point I'm making is that things have changed. They want us to come in, and the French have been obliging, and of course the chef de guerre now is Monsieur Hollande. But let me go over to the, the so-called Arab Spring. I don't call it a spring because, like so many of the expressions used about the Middle East, it was created partly by the State Department. Do you remember the famous Cedar Revolution in Lebanon? No one in Lebanon knew what this Cedar Revolution was. It was a State Department spokesman who invented it. There aren't an awful lot of cedars left in Lebanon, uh, <coughs> but there you go. Um, <coughs> I do happen to believe that the actual Arab awakening, and I use that phrase because that was the title of George Antonius's wonderful seminal book of 1938, and prescient book, because he saw what was going to happen after the Second World War, in which he recorded the conflicting and thus totally betrayal-like 
promises of the British to the Arabs that they would have a free Arab people and a free Arab nation if they assisted us, uh, the Allies, Britain and France, and rather late in the day, as usual, the Americans, in the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. And, of course, we promised in 1917 through Mr. Balfour, as he then was, later Lord Balfour, to give British support to a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And needless to say, they were conflicting promises. Promises are meant to be kept. And, as usual, we Brits broke them both. We did not give the Arabs the free Arab land. And, of course, we didn't actually give support to a Jewish homeland in Palestine, only to a bit of it. There are many um, Jewish historians who point this out constantly, and they're right. But, you see, we were in the middle of the First World War, where, rather like Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush, you throw promises everywhere, because national interests come first. I think that Beirut in 2005, a million people demonstrating with no guidance or orders. This was not a government demonstration. This wasn't a dictator's demonstration. They came into central Beirut to say the Syrian army must go. Unfortunately, the Syrian Mahabharat, the intelligence services, stayed behind. But, of course, with UN help and the French and the Americans, they got them out. That was the first immediate total population mass that I ever saw in the Middle East in my 30, almost 37 years now, demonstrating and getting what they want. Alas, there weren't enough Shiites there, but Lebanon is a sectarian state. 2009, after the victory of Ahmadinejad, who is a crackpot, by the way, um, I, I think also, I have to tell you, I think he won that election, but not by the massive um, figure that he suggested. I was on the streets with that mass of a million people, more than a million people, walking to Azadi Square, another Freedom Square. Um, and it was fascinating to see the way in which they, as soon as people knew that I'd just arrived from Beirut, how did they do it in Beirut? Did they use Twitters? Did they use uh, mobile phone cameras? And in fact, I remember at the time of the demonstrations in Beirut how Bashar al-Assad mocked them. This is 2005, remember. And he said, there aren't such big crowds. He said, this just zoom, zoom. And of course, the next day, everyone in the center of Beirut hold big placards with Bashar and zoom, zoom on it. <laughs> um, he, he spotted the technology, but got it wrong. <coughs> I once asked, well, in fact, quite recently, just after a few days after Mubarak was chucked out, I went to see my old friend and colleague, um, Mohammed Hussein in Haeckel. Now, I think, 93 years old, still playing golf, great fettle, still smoking cigars. I must have met him for chats, I suppose, about 50 times in the past 37 years, and only twice has he offered me a cigar. <laughs> Both of them, by the way, I smoked and enjoyed, but I put the little label in a plastic packet given me by Mohammed Hassan in Hegel, the second cigar. I've even written about it, so he's got the hint. I'm waiting to see him when I go back to Egypt in a couple of months' time. Anyway, I said to Mohammed Hegel, look, what happened when, when Hosni Mubarak became the president after Sadat, you know, another dictator, was assassinated? What happens to these people? He said, Robert, when you are a dictator, you walk into a sea of quietness. You're isolated. And of course, the people become your children. They're school children. Remember the last speech that Mubarak made when we all thought he was going to uh, leave, and he then said he wasn't going to leave, and everyone was chucking shoes at the big screen in Tahrir Square. He said, my children, my children. You see, he actually believed it. And in this school children's world that Mubarak, and of course Ben Ali, and the Assads, and all the other dictators, who are, of course, largely, and for most of the time, we have supported, um, they, they loved the idea that these would be school children, they would have to obey the headmaster, you know, Mr. Hosni or Mr. Ben Ali and so on. And um, as long as they did that, they would not have to go to the police station and perhaps be tortured and so on. And they were given, apart from, you know, uh, subsidies for bread, they were given, you know, fake governments, fake ministries, fake elections, of course, fake newspapers, all the trappings of a real state without it actually being a real state, because a state is owned by its people and Egypt and Tunisia and Syria and Bahrain, of course, are not owned by their people. They're owned by the dictators. They regard their country as their personal property. And so you had the people of Egypt, the largest Arab country, which is one reason I'm concentrating on it, who lived through this dark miasma. What was the background? Why did that revolution happen when it did in Egypt? I don't think it was just Twitters and Tweeters and YouTubes and Internet and mobile phones. Uh, you can tell I don't like the Internet because I don't use email. But 
the fact of the matter is that that did count. Technology was important. We put far too much attention into that, however. There were two other things which was vitally important in Egypt. When I first went to Egypt in 1976 as a reporter, I'd been there before, I used to go and interview students at the University of Cairo, not the American University, which is very well funded, but the government state University of Cairo. And the standard of education was deplorable. I mean, I think there were three to 400 books in the library for five to 6,000 students. Um, when I went back to Egypt uh, to give a lecture, when my book was published, my second book was published in, um, in Arabic at the uh, Cairo Opera House, I went to give a lecture at the University of Cairo, and the academic standards were magnificent. The library had thousands of volumes. The people, even under Mubarak, there was enormous increase in education. I have to say that at the Opera House, I had a great pleasure because the whole of the front row were Egyptian intelligence officers with paper and pens. <laughs> so the first thing I thought was, OK, I've got a whole pile of copies of my talk. So I went around and gave it out. You, know, you don't even have to copy notes. And the first question came from a lady who was sitting about over there, a university student, and she said, Mr. Fisk, do you think Egypt is a democracy? <laughs> so I said, how long does it take to get from here to the international airport? <laughs> and the cops in the front row were trying to work out how many kilometers it was and how many minutes it would take. <laughs> That's what happens in dictatorships, you see. So you had education. People became educated. And there was one other thing. When I first went to Egypt as a journalist, more than 30 years ago, most Egyptians had never been abroad. Perhaps the, the most they'd seen of the outside world was working in Libya, which is not the outside world. Um, or they'd been, of course, many of them to Mecca for the Hajj. But they'd never been anywhere else. For them, Egypt was the world. They used to insist to me that Cairo was exactly the same as New York. In some ways, it's actually a bit nicer than New York, but you'll see that it isn't actually the same. But for Egyptians, this was the world. By the time of Mubarak's departure, most Egyptians had been abroad. They'd been to the Gulf, they'd worked in the Gulf, some of them had been up to the Levant, they'd been to Syria, and of course they'd been to Europe, and they'd been to the West, and they'd been to America and Canada. They knew what other countries were like. And they realized that in other countries, people, though you may not always think so under your conservative government, own their own country. <laughs> Whereas in Egypt, it was the personal property of his Lord High Highness, Mr. Mubarak. I noticed, by the way, the King of Bahrain now insists he's called um, his, 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 royal, his, his Royal Highness the King of Bahrain. Bahrain being about slightly smaller, I think, than Edmonton. But anyway, the point I'm making is that the people of Egypt had three things going for them. Increased education, experience of the world, of course, they also had Al Jazeera Arabic by then, and technology. And suddenly... The people of Egypt grew up. I don't say that in a racist way. I mean, they're very intelligent Egyptians, even with a massive illiteracy rate. But they grew up. They became adults, only to find that it was the government that was full of children, one of whom was 84 years old. And that's what I saw happening. But there was a big story that I missed, and most people still, I think, don't understand. I missed it because I was stupid, and I'll tell you how. Back in 2006... In the town of Mahala, north of Cairo, about 62 miles north of Cairo, um, it's a big cotton factory centre. Cotton, major uh, in industrial export from Egypt, very important economic centre. And in Mahala, in 2006, the people rose up, led by women. I actually went there after the revolution and met the first woman who got the other women to shame the men into joining them. And they marched to the central square of Mahala, which of course was called Tahrir Square, little tiny Tahrir Square. They put up tents. They told the police to leave. Of course, the police used tear gas. They brought in the Baltagi, the, the thugs, ex-policemen, drug addicts with iron rods to beat them, and they fought them back. They used um, phones to call in the uh, peasantry from the country round. We're talking about the Nile Delta, of course. And for six days, they held out. The Egyptian revolution had begun then. This revolution had begun then. And at the end, they got uh, better working conditions, uh, they got better pay, they did, did not get what they had also demanded, which was the end of Mubarak. They tried again in 2007, and it was a washout. But the first industrial workers to come into the big Tahrir Square, January, February, you know, 2011, two years ago, 
were the industrial cotton workers of Mahala. And this is very interesting because these were trade unionists. And if you look across the Middle East now, you will, I'm looking at the chaotic scenes. Those nations which had real and strong trade unions, Egypt and remarkably Tunisia, despite the 860, 870 martyrs of the Egyptian revolution, the bloodshed was considerably less than it was in those nations, which either had trade unions which had become concreted into the institutions of dictatorship, like Syria, or where they didn't exist at all, like Libya. I'm not quite sure why the trade unions were so important, but they clearly were. I'm hoping that there'll be all kinds of PhD theses in a few years' time that I can read about this. Mahala is the place to start. Um, but just to show you the weaknesses of journalism, I was sitting on my balcony in Beirut, reading in the Beirut press about this trade union. I said, it's just a trade union dispute. You know, there's always a few Egyptians complaining about Mahala. I didn't even go to Mahala. My goodness me, I should have done. And I guess when I say that, I'm trying to draw your attention to the failings and weaknesses of journalism, the cliches which we throw at you, which we cover over you, so that the, the tragedy of the Middle East doesn't look so bad. You know, when I started off in journalism uh, on the Newcastle Evening Chronicle in the Blythe district office, anyone here knows Blythe in Northumberland in England? No, good. Well, you wouldn't ever want to go there. Um, <laughs> anyway, there I started off. And what we were always taught, it's 50-50 journalism. You do a story, there's a dispute of some kind, you give 50% of your report to one side and 50% to the other side of the dispute. So when I had to cover Blythe Spartans football club against Gateshead, Blythe got 50% and then the brave footwork of Gateshead got the other. When I was covering a public inquiry into a new British motorway, you would give 50% of your report to the government, why they wanted this fine new motorway to go through an area of great natural beauty, and then you would hear the people say why they didn't want it to go there. But the Middle East is not a football match. It is a bloody tragedy of unending proportions. And I believe that journalists have to adopt a different system of journalism and morality when they deal with the Middle East. Yes, I think we should be neutral and objective, but neutral and objective on the side of those who suffer. You know, if you were reporting, um, let's say, the slave trade in the 18th century, would you give 50% of your report to the slaves and the, the details of those who've been thrown overboard? Or would you give another 50% to the slave ship captain? No, you're right about the slaves. If you were present at the liberation of an extermination camp in Nazi Germany, you wouldn't give the SS spokesman a say. You'd talk about the Jewish survivors and the masses who had died and been murdered by the Nazis. When I was in Jerusalem in 2000, when the uh, Sabaro Pizzeria was blown up and Israeli children and women were killed by a suicide bomber, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who could see the children? Remember, a suicide bomber is an executioner. He sees who he's going to kill. Did I give half my story to the spokesman of the Islamic Jihad movement? No. I wrote about the survivors, and I wrote about the dead, a child whose eyes had been blown out, a woman with a chair leg through her. Sabra Shatila, exactly the same thing. When I was in Sabra Shatila, I wrote about the dead, some of whom I physically had to climb over in heaps and about the survivors. I did not give half my story to the excuses of the Israeli army which sent the Lebanese militias into the camp who were the murderers. So what I'm saying is 50-50 doesn't work in the Middle East, but we journalists still try to play games. Have you noticed how, for example, very often the occupied territories are referred to as the disputed territories? See, in a dispute, you get a couple of people, you're arguing about a little bit of land over a cup of tea, maybe with a couple of lawyers, you can solve it. Don't worry, it's okay, you see. Look at the wall. Now, I go to Israel. Uh, I go into Israel. I always stay at the King David Hotel, the big Jewish hotel in West Jerusalem, which I like very much. And, of course, I go all over the West Bank and into Gaza. And that wall is more monstrous when you see it to the naked eye than it is in photographs or any film you'll see on television. But we don't like to call it a wall. Well, I do, and my paper calls it a wall. But if you look at most newspapers... Hands up here who read the National Post. Be honest. <laughs> Why? <laughs> At least seven people. Or the Globe and Mail. We won't ask the hands up there. Oh, yes, we will. How many people read the Globe and Mail? Bad news for the National Post, but still a sorry situation. Look, you will not find it mostly called a wall. It's called a fence, isn't it? 
or at a fence like you might have at the bottom of your garden to stop the sheep straying in when it's not winter, right? And sometimes it's called a security fence or a security barrier, like, you know, sort of iron bar you open up at the side of the farm. Sicherheit, German security, is the very word the East German government used about the Berlin Wall, and we use it. Notice this word, settlement. I have tried and tried and failed to find when we started calling what is clearly a colony a settlement. Settlement's kind of friendly and nice. Be fair, in French, it is colony and colon. The French use it perfectly. But we don't. It's a settlement. Even worse, it's becoming a neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood near Jerusalem. That's a code word, you see. And I noticed the other day, we actually had um, Daniel Pipes, a great hero of mine, as you can imagine. Daniel Pipes saying, um, oh, but he was criticizing, I always, by the way, I don't use things from the internet. This is a real clipping. This is the National Post, which was, I am addic <laughs> addicted to. And the, the, cap, the, the, the title is The Anti-Zionist. You know who that is. It's the, uh, our favorite pre United States president, Mr. Obama. And what Pipe says is Obama created crises over Israeli housing starts. <laughs> now, I know that a start in your uh, Canadian-American language means projects, but even projects, something good for the future, you see. And in this way, we desemanticize the tragedy. We allow you, or especially those of you who are not interested in the Middle East, to think, well, it's not that big a deal. And we always have this story, oh, there's got to be a secure Israel and a viable Palestinian state. I'll tell you what I think. I don't think we're going to see a state of Palestine. I go to the West Bank over and over and over. Last trip, I was stunned at the increase constantly, as we speak now, of these Jewish colonies for Jews and Jews only on Arab land. Thank God for Israelis like Amir Haas, fine journalist, friend of mine on Haaretz, Uri Avnery, a bit hard of hearing, I saw him a few weeks ago, but still going out there, 90 years old, uh, writing every week a blog on the iniquities of what are being done to the Palestinians. But when you see the amount of colonies which exist now in the West Bank and the roads for the settlers, and the cordon sanitaire, which is now supposed to exist in the Jordan Valley, not to mention I discovered a nature reserve. I asked an Israeli soldier on the nearest checkpoint whether the animals were to be on the inside or the outside. <laughs> he had the same reaction, to be fair, as you just did. He agreed with me. But I don't think the land is left for the Palestinians. Now, Lord Blair, oh, by the way, peace process, there's another one. It's never proceeded anywhere. The State Department started peace process, by the way. It went right back to Carter and Vance, that expression. Um, but peace process, processu du pay, it's incredible the way in which we accept it. And what happens when there's a problem? Well, we have to put the peace process, what's the cliche? Back on track, right? It's a railway train, it's a carriage. It comes off, you put it back on the track again. But then Tony Blair arrives. <laughs> Why are you sniggering at my former <laughs> prime minister? <laughs> by the way, if any one of you can explain Tony Blair to me, come and see me at the end of this lecture. There was a very fine article in the Sunday Times not long ago. I hate to advertise my rivals, but he wrote a wonderful piece. He said, since Tony Blair has such a close relationship with God, why doesn't God give him some advice from time to time? <laughs> you know, like Tony, this Iraq thing may not be such a good idea. But the conclusion must be, I fear, that Tony is a, a one-directional message. He's talking to God, not the other way around. <laughs> Anyway, you have the peace process, you go back on it. What happened when Blair arrived? It was no longer a train, it became a road map. Do you remember that? Yeah. You see? The other day, I've been waiting for it, and it actually popped up in a British paper, the road map had to be put back on track. So it was both a car <laughs> and a train. These are the cliches we swamp you with, and the intention is to stop you worrying. And if you complain, if you suggest there are human rights abuses, apart from the fact that you will, of course, immediately and slanderously be accused of anti-Semitism, people will not understand. It's about a dispute over a cup of tea, perhaps. A fence. <laughs> My goodness me, a neighborhood. What is this nonsense about the Palestinians? And don't, didn't we give them democratic elections? I mean, they pesky Palestinians obviously voted for the wrong people, but we did give them <laughs> some democracy, didn't we? Why wasn't the word democracy shouted by the people of the Arab revolutions. Not once did I ever hear anyone demanding democracy. They asked for dignity and they asked for justice, which we do not intend to give them. 
for all the reasons you know. Why didn't they ask for democracy? Well, why should they? In their eyes, the Western democracies have for decades been supporting the Arab dictators, on and on and on. So democracy for Arabs means the people who kept the Mubaraks and the Ben Ali's and the Assads where they are, and the king of Bahrain, and the king of Saudi Arabia, the whole bloody lot. So why should they want to buy our democracy? They might like some packets of it from our supermarket shelves, but it's a dodgy commodity when we ourselves have betrayed the name democracy over and over again in the Middle East. I want to sort of concentrate again on, on the role of the press in all this. You know, there's now a sort of right-wing journalism that's actually saying, I'm sure you realize this, that the invasion of Iraq was a good thing, yet again, I mean, you know, forget the weapons of mass, mass destruction, our great love for the Iraqi people. The fact of the matter is that this started democracy in the Middle East. Nonsense. It didn't do anything of the kind. And there wasn't a single Arab in Iraq I ever met who actually wanted to demand democracy, that wonderful Greek word, at the front. I mean, what they actually wanted was electricity, water. They didn't want their children kidnapped on the way home from school after the American invasion. But I think the problem, and this applies to our reaction, our feelings about the Arab awakening, is that we, as Westerners, don't care about the people who live there. We've never cared. We've always offered them freedoms. General Angus Maud, 1917, Baghdad. Uh, the uh, declaration to the people of the Mahafazat, the governor of Baghdad. We come here not as conquerors, but as liberators to free you from generations of tyranny. Followed, by the way, by an uprising against British rule in 1920, and it started in a town called Fallujah, which some of you will remember. You see how the historical thing, and always we come to give freedom to the Arabs, and we come with our tanks and our horses and our Bradley fighting vehicles and our swords. And is it surprising that it doesn't look like the kind of commodity you really want? So how do, we, how do we journalists manipulate this for you? Every time I come to the Americas, South America, North America, American, Canada, I always grab hold of an American paper, and always there is an example of what I mean in what I call officials said. You know, you look for a source, you go to the government. There is an osmotic, parasitic relationship between journalism and government, between reporters and power. You don't have to, and I'm not asking you to watch CNN or Fox, as you should watch Fox, just for two hours, and you'd realize that what I'm saying is true. But, it, you know, if you, if you watch it, news comes on, we're going over now to John, you're at the Pentagon, what is the Pentagon saying? Well, what the Pentagon says is, you see, it's become not a mouthpiece, it's, it's just a funnel the press has become. And so here is the last one I, I ripped from my files. Again, no internet, real clippings. An article from the Boston Globe, November the 2nd, 2012. No, a couple of months ago, three months ago. Um, it's an article about how the CIA tried to save the life of the American ambassador who was murdered um, at the consulate in Benghazi in Libya just before Christmas. Um, it's written by Greg Miller in Washington, which is a very good place to report Libya from. And it's basically, I'll give you the first part of the sentence. The CIA rushed security operatives to an American diplomatic compound in Libya within 25 minutes, US intelligence officials said. That's the sourcing for this story. And we continue on. Paragraph two, US officials said, by the account provided by, to the you know, obsequious journalist, by senior US intelligence officials. US officials said, US intelligence officials insisted, they're a bit more strong on that now, a senior US intelligence official, more senior than before. <laughs> officials reiterated, just in case the reporter hadn't got the point, they said, <laughs> Column four, it hasn't even finished yet. UN officials said, the senior, he's back, the senior US intelligence officials said, the officials said, the officials said, the officials said, officials said, a bit bigger, and then the senior, he's back again, senior US intelligence officials said. Ladies and gentlemen, if that is journalism, I don't have a job. <laughs> I'm going to move away from the Arab awakening for a moment because I want to keep on this question of language and actually telling it, cliche, telling it how it is in the Middle East, which I try to do. And I'm not the only one. There's lots of my colleagues struggle away like I do. Um, there are an awful lot who don't, and that's the problem. But I want to give you now an example of what it's like to see fine writing about the Middle East. Um, this is, I'm going to read you two extra extracts from Letters Home to the um, United States from uh, a US Marine Major in Ramadi. Ramadi is the next city after Fallujah, heading west from Baghdad. 
dangerous Sunni al-Qaeda area. Um, letter to, he wrote to his dad on the 25th of May 2005. Uh, I should tell you, I've had permission to read this to you. He's trying to explain to his family what his job is as an occupation soldier. He, he, by the way, I, I don't agree with all the things he says, but he writes like Joseph Conrad. Listen to this. He's trying to get the Iraqis to get involved in local government, you know, to run themselves, which is easier for the Americans, of course. We are, trying to, we are trying to empower their police to walk alongside the Marines, but the graft has not yet taken. There is something culturally childish in Iraqi understanding of basic Western governance and management that will require immeasurable education and probably several generations to overcome if they find it of any interest. That education is, of course, a choice that they have to make on their own. They are not our people. Our understanding of their tribal governance and its relationship to formal civic management is equally naive and charges our frustration. The problem now is that every inconvenience has become our responsibility. They act as if they cannot comprehend our sacrifices and are thus ungrateful for them. Even though it is not their um, desire to offend, we are insulted and it bleeds us of affection and tolerance. Liberation will compete with invasion as our legacy, but locally we are ideologically irrelevant. Our presence is mostly only of interest to those who seek to benefit from our contracts and donations. No future, just daily survival, family and tribe. Our contributions may be counted long after we have withdrawn, but they will not recount the names of our dead. Each wound will be absorbed. Our loss, however, will have never even occurred to most people here. And just to show you that this Marine has a sense of humour, here's another letter from a different date. He was actually wounded by uh, the fam infamous Im uh, improvised explosive device, uh, but insisted on being hospitalised in Baghdad and going back to his unit. Anyway, he's trying to talk now about how local government works, because we all believe we want to impose democracy, you see, on the Iraqis. And here is a guy, Major Benjamin Bush. He's actually just published an excellent book, a wonderful book you should read. B-U-S-C-H, by the way, in case you should make any mistakes there. Um, these letters are not sadly included in the book, but they're going to be included in my next book, with his permission. Here he is, um, trying to explain about how to get democracy working in Iraq. I dare you not to laugh during this. So he says to his family, what news about the new government, you may ask? Well, the provisional military governor was replaced by the transitional governor, who resigned under threat and was replaced with another transitional governor. He was then replaced by the emergency appointed governor, who was just replaced by the selected governor chosen by the elected provincial council. He never made a speech or publicized his views, never debated the other candidates, and was not present during the elections, never making an acceptance speech. He was promptly kidnapped by a rival tribe, while his tribe fought another tribe on the Syrian border. The recently displaced emergency appointed governor returned in hope of regaining his position, but the deputy governor is now serving as the acting governor while the actual selected governor is in captivity. <laughs> You're already laughing, you see. But there is an election. There was an election, so democracy is in full bloom, I am to understand. <laughs> you think the Arabs wanted to learn about our democracy to stage an awakening in Egypt and Tunisia? I haven't finished. It gets better. We are now trying to force the power of decision onto the elected provincial council and the city officials. It's a difficult thing, he writes, to keep myself inactive in matters of governance here. The instinct to impose order and command the requisite discipline in the Iraqi leadership must be quelled in order to allow sovereign stewardship to develop at its native pace and in a native form. I fight myself to remain insignificant in the process. I haven't the nature for passive observation. I share the American fascination with action, and it has consistently betrayed us in our foreign policy. Our continued involvement will continue the state of dependency, and our eventual departure will leave nothing but cosmetic structure here. Iraq will return to what it is. Our common sense is not common to this people, and that understanding must be given proper respect. I do my best, but I twitch with an urge for the folly of intrusion. That's Joseph Conrad. Why don't we read stuff like that in the New York Times? That tells you what's going on in the Middle East. That tells you about the failure of our desire, which is false in my view, for democracy in the Middle East. We love dictators. You know, just after the Madrid bombings, which forced the uh, Spanish government uh, to withdraw the Spanish troops from 
there was the coalition of the willing, remember, as opposed to the vast coalition of the unwilling. And the Spanish, I went to the Spanish barracks down Highway 18 from Baghdad, an awful road full of you know, hooded men and thugs and kidnapping. And the Spanish did want to leave, I spoke to them. But as I was leaving the Spanish camp that evening, it was a huge American, giant guy way above me, with a huge pistol too, who said he was from the agency. He was a CIA guy attached to the uh, Spanish base. And he said, uh, Bob, he said, you know, there are armed men on the streets at night. And then the great time question, what went wrong? <laughs> so I said, well, you know, the first thing I said, it might have been a good idea when you arrived in Baghdad to set up a massive hospital city. Come hither all you masses and the poor, right? But of course, an Iraqi who was wounded or who was ill could not go to American military medical establishments. They were told to go to their own hospital. And then I said to him, you know, you might have thought of taking a bit of an example from the Romans. I wasn't recommending crucifixion, but I was <laughs> suggesting to him that, you know, in the Roman Empire, everyone outside the empire was a barbarian, a terrorist. But once Rome had expanded its territory, empires always have to get bigger because they have to viscerally demonstrate their power. That's why we went to Baghdad, one of the reasons. And once those people came inside the empire, they became citizens of Rome. And I said to this guy, what if the Americans had told the Iraqis, because we loved the Iraqis so much, that's why we gave the lives of our soldiers to rescue them from Saddam, why not give every Iraqi citizen an American passport? I said, they wouldn't have rushed to JFK. They're Iraqis, they want to live in Iraq. But they say, my goodness, they really do love us. We're part of them. No Al-Qaeda, why should they be? They'll be American citizens, you see. Now, obviously, I was you know, having a little bit of a joke with him. And, but I knew that this was not an idea that would commend itself to Mr. Bush or Mr. Blair. Clearly not. Um, and, you know, why did we invade Iraq? I mean, if the gross national product and export of Iraq had been asparagus or potatoes, do you really think the 82nd Airborne would have gone to Mosul? <laughs> Excuse me, you know. One of the interesting things, going back to the Arab awakening with a searchlight over it all, is how the Arabs followed their colonial frontiers and kept to them. You know, most of the frontiers in the Middle East were drawn by us before or after the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, which followed the 1418 war, the First World War, the Great War. And we didn't see millions of Egyptians flocking to help the Libyan rebels. We didn't see tens of thousands of Jordanians rushing across the border into Syria to help the Syrian rebels. What was most interesting was that the borders we drew, the West drew, remained. Oddly enough, wherever you have a military checkpoint in the Middle East, it also remains. You know, a Palestinian checkpoint in the Lebanese Civil War became a Lebanese army checkpoint, then it became an Israeli army checkpoint in 82, then it went back, etc. But colonial frontiers are inviolate. That was one of the extraordinary things I discovered uh, in, in this period of the awakening. Syria. Got to talk about Syria. Total tragedy, total bloodbath. There was a time when, you know, even accepting that which is true that the Assad regime was a brutal and, and is a brutal regime. You could go to Aleppo and say, this is one city in the Middle East where you've got every possible different group, Christian, Maronite, Armenians, Druze, Sunnis, uh, Alawites, and they could live and work together, and they did. Now, under a terrible regime, but they did. Al Aleppo was a symbol that the Middle Eastern people could live together. What did happen in Syria? Well, an enormous number of immensely courageous Syrians said basically, look, if the Egyptians can have these freedoms and regain their dignity, why shouldn't this dignity also belong to us? Quite soon after these mass demonstrations were so cruelly suppressed, and they went on, didn't they? On and on and on, unarmed. There were armed men in Syria. Uh, there was an Al, Jaz Al Jazeera clip of film I've seen taken next to a village I visited where you can actually see armed men in April of 2011, much earlier than the narrative tells us, fighting, you can see them shooting at Syrian troops on the other side of the border from Lebanon. Certainly in Daraa, once the demonstrations got underway, there is videotape of armed men. But it was only after Syrians were forced to defend their families by taking up arms that we saw what became the armed rebellion. Um, last September, August and September, I spent quite a lot of time in Aleppo and Syria, not with the rebels. We have correspondence with the rebels, of course, in Aleppo and outside Damascus, but with the Syrian government army. This was a bit like feeling you were with the Wehrmacht in the Eastern Front in World War II, when you should have been on the Russian side at Stalingrad, but it was an eye-opener. 
uh, I got access to generals, Sunnis, a lot of Sunni generals. I, I met the, in one unit on the front line of Aleppo, a Christian explosives officer, a Druze intelligence officer. This was access no one had had before from the West, certainly no journalist anyway. And I talked to the generals, and it was very interesting because apart from the fact that, and we're talking about September, not now, apart from the fact that the morale of the army was still not broken, it was quite clear that the senior officers were searching for some role. What do you think of the Syrian army? And I, I said to them, do you want me to lie or do you want me to tell you the truth? Oh, the truth, the truth, al haqiqa Of course, they have to say that, don't they? They're not going to ask me to lie, are they? But the point is, I said to them, well, look, you are stained and contaminated by the vicious torturers of the Mahabharat, the intelligence services, and by the Shabiha. There is no Shabiha. I said, there is a Shabiha. There is an Alawite militia, just as there are Sunni militias. Excuse me. And they were silent. They didn't deny it anymore. They didn't say, oh, you've got it quite right there, Bob. Oh, yes, no, absolutely not. But their silence spoke. Because in law, silence gives consent. And what was particularly interesting is that they were obviously searching for a new role for themselves in a new Syria. Perhaps you know, with Bashar around, but not the Ba'athist regime. Now, run this movie forward, and we have... Um, how many of you saw, even in a tiny clip, Bashar al-Assad's last speech at the um, Assad, of course, Opera House in Damascus? Anyone see it? Right, well, you may have noticed that behind him was a big screen with lots and lots and lots of little black and white photographs of men's faces. These were martyrs of Syria. Yes, but they were all soldiers of the government army who had been killed. And in his speech in a bit that was significantly not reported in the Western press. He kept talking about the Syrian army. Our martyrs in the army, our brave warrant officers, our brave soldiers. Only one mention of the Ba'ath Party and none of the Assad family. And it was quite clear to me, given my experience in Aleppo and Damascus before, that the idea is coming about that the Ba'ath Party will have to go, that the Assad family as an institution is finished, and that the president knows that, and he's hoping that somehow, with a new foundational centre of the army, he can hang on. Now, I met face-to-face -face with Syrian army intelligence officers in uniform who were regularly, sometimes almost daily, meeting with officers in the Free Syrian Army. And they're trying to persuade them to come back. Look, look at these Islamist rebels who are with you. You want the Islamists in power in Damascus? That was the argument. In other words, the government of Syria is trying to get the cities back without fighting for them. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm not saying it's going to work. It probably won't. But that, I think, is what is happening in Syria as we sit here tonight. Um, of course, the situation changes from day to day. Uh, all this I learned long before this latest terrible uh, massacre, at least the 87 bodies or more of just under 87, which were discovered on the Quake. Well, the Quake River is now just a sewer, but outside Aleppo, which is along the front lines. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in Syria. I always say... Uh, my crystal ball is broken. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the Gulf, though that is where we should always keep our eye. The Bahraini Shiites, by the way, who are a majority, and who originally were quite happy to say, oh, we love the Crown Prince, we just don't want the Prime Minister, we'd like to have him elected. And when I actually went straight to the government of Bahrain, I got a straight answer from a civil servant, we can't have a Prime Minister, a prime minister who's elected here, the Saudis wouldn't let us. Of course, the Saudis soon came in to help uh, the government occupy their own land. Um, they were too fast. They should have held on and had a bit more patience, the poor old Bahrainis. But if, for example, the Arab Revolution ever reaches Saudi Arabia, it will not come from the Shiites. It will come from within the royal family. Just as in Jordan, where our, all our journalist colleagues are telling us that, you know, um, the threat to King Abdullah comes from the Muslim Brotherhood. It's always the Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood. It comes from the Muslim Brotherhood, who've just, um, in these elections now, are boycotting them. I don't think it does. I think the threat to King Abdullah comes from within the Jordanian army. And I'll tell you why, because two years ago I met with the Veterans Association, which is an immensely powerful political and military tool in Jordan, who had just written a letter to King Abdullah, which they showed me, demanding an end to the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel, and an end to the promotion of Palestinians in institutional society, to senior roles in the civil service, government, etc. So these are things I'm seeing out there where I live, and which I don't see in the papers. I try to get it into my paper, and I don't have any opposition to that. I get it in. But these, this is the, the way the Arab awakening looks to me at the moment. Um, 
poor old Palestine. I don't think it's going to happen. Somebody will ask me about the one-state solution. Good luck. I've got a reply. But um, I don't think, you know, we, we, all our leaders, including the blessed Stephen Harper as well, they all go on about the peace process. It's over. It's finished. It ain't going to happen. I'm sorry to sound so pessimistic tonight. Um, perhaps I'll just say one more thing about the issue of revolutions. The great revolution in Egypt for me, and I spent ages reading every book available and translating from the Arabic with friends doing it for me, is the great revolution of Saad Zaghloul, whom all Egyptians here tonight, and of course a lot of Arabs too, who are not from Egypt will know, was the great lawyer who led the first mass demonstrations against British rule in Egypt, in Cairo. His wife was a great feminist who went door to door, marched with him in the streets to all the foreign embassies saying, you know, Brits must go. Rather familiar since I covered Northern Ireland and heard the same thing from the Irish Catholics there. But this was a demonstration. Of course, the Brits picked up uh, poor old Saza Glor. They sent him off to Malta and Seychelles and various other holiday resorts we reserve for, um, you know, um, nefarious people who don't go along with our point of view. We did actually try to persuade the Egyptians to have a democracy. And they actually had a parliament. And the parliamentarian opposition said, we want to get rid of King Farouk. So we locked them up, of course. And thus, you see, the colonial era brought about a situation where you were encouraged to speak out and be the opposition, a bit like the Palestinians were encouraged to vote and then voted for the wrong people. And so the moment the people said what they thought, get rid of the king, we locked them up. So that is why the opposition began to move over the war years and during Nasser and then right up to now into the one place they could meet together with more than three people. That's an emergency law in Egypt. And that was the mosque. And we're surprised that the Muslim Brotherhood exists. You know, I, I had a journalist, American journalist, a friend of mine, come to see me in my balcony in Beirut some time ago. Uh, free coffee starts at 10. Um, and he said to me, Robert, why aren't you saying in the paper that the Islamists have hijacked the revolution? A Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood in Tunisia, he meant the Anahta party of Ganoushi. Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, the Muslim Brotherhood against um, Bashar al-Assad, etc. And I said, are you worried about the name Muslim? Is this the problem? You know, I said, most of the people who live in this area are Muslims. And I promise you, they're not likely to convert to Christianity because you'll feel better about it. And I said, you know, in, in, in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, there is a Christian Democrat party. But we don't expect them, because of the word Christian, to start the 13th Crusade. What is this nonsense? Now, I have to say that when I was in Tahrir Square and all the other streets of Greater Cairo, I only once saw a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, except on the big television screen where I saw the Muslim Brotherhood chatting to Mubarak. So there was an element of coming in on the revolution and using it without participating. But I have to say that such is this chaos in Egypt now that Mohammed Morsi is not an Islamist. He's not Osama bin Laden in the sense of an extremist who's going to crush all the cops and Christians. I get this in almost every talk I give in, uh, in, in Canada from Egyptians usually. Um, you know, when Morsi came in, we said the army had hijacked the revolution, the SCAF, the supreme command of the armed forces. And then Morsi sacked the two top generals, and we all said, great, Morsi understands democracy. And then we said, oh, the, now the Muslim Brotherhood's hijacking the revolution. And now we're, gonna, we're saying again the army's coming back, because Assisi has actually made a, a statement, the new guy appointed by Morsi, that Egypt's on the edge of civil war. That's always a sign that the army are getting ready to have some more of the beautiful uh, American-made tanks on the streets. Um, revolutions are not, do not always have happy endings. I will not mention the French Revolution. I will not mention uh, the Russian Revolution. American Revolution, I guess it did have a happy ending, if you're not, um, you know, if you're an American citizen, it had a happy ending anyway. But this, this idea that we want people to have their freedom, which Bush kept talking about, even Mrs. Bush said that, you know, the wonderful Mubarak, because he agreed that there could be certain, you know, easing up on elections, which were fake anyway. When I was writing, well, I am writing a new book called Night of Power. Um, another 1,300-page book, which I strongly advise you not to buy. Um, I found this wonderful quotation. when a, It's a British um, intelligence agent in 1920, when the um, Iraqi um, uh, insurgency against the British army after the First World War had begun. And he spoke to a leading uh, divine, a man called Alwan al Yasseri. The al Yasseri family is still very prominent in Iraq. The conversation took place on the 5th of July, 1920. And here is Mr. Alwan. This must be an accurate quote, because no one could make this one up, even if he was a British intelligence officer. You have offered us independence, Mr. Al-Yasri told the Brit. We never asked for it. 
We never dreamt of it till you put the idea into our heads. For hundreds of years, the country's lived in a state as far removed from independence as it's possible to conceive. Then you come with your promise of independence. And every time we ask for it, you imprison us. You see, if you were an Arab in the streets of Cairo, would you trust the Brits and the Americans and our democracies? I don't think so. And I think you'd be right not to trust us. Make a final comment to you. Um, why does the Middle East crisis really exist? Um, I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, maybe you do. But over all the thousands of conversations, I've spent more than half my life in the Muslim world. Of course, I live in the Muslim part of Beirut. I've felt over and over again this question arising. We in the West, I say we, I mean, you know, in Europe it used to be called Christendom, <laughs> even up to the Renaissance. But we in the West have largely lost our faith. I don't know if this is because of the Treaty of Vienna, the First World War, but our gods today tend to be Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Geneva Conventions, the International Red Cross. But the people of the Middle East have not lost their faith. They still believe that the Quran is the word of God as transmitted to the Prophet Muhammad. And that faith involves their, their lives, their families, their homes, in everything they do. We may not like that. It doesn't apply to every single Muslim. But by and large, that is the case. And the question must arise, which I cannot answer. How did it happen? And this, I suspect, is the real question that lies behind the foundation of Islamic fear, humiliation, and at the same time, an admiration for themselves as a people after the Arab awakening. How can it be that a people who have kept their faith and believe in God and have never lost their faith could culturally, militarily, financially, economically find themselves under the yoke, oppression, suppression, pressure of a people who have lost their faith? That, I cannot answer you that question. Maybe you can. That was acclaimed and award-winning journalist Robert Fisk speaking at the University of Alberta's International Week on January 31st, 2013. Thank you very much for tuning in to CJSR's Think, a series that highlights lectures and keynote addresses from noteworthy individuals about some of the most crucial issues facing the world today. I've been your host, Matt Hergy, and this episode of Think was produced by CJSR's Camille James. If you have any questions on this series or any of the other programs that you hear on CJSR FM 88.5 every week, please visit cjsrnews.com.